Warning, All Things Crime is a true crime production that may contain violent or disturbing material. Viewer or listener discretion is advised. Um, when we get into the weird stuff, there tends to be a more compulsive element to it. So the person can't stop. And so, and the, you know, targeting of strangers too, right? That's the stranger. Most people, people don't realize that it's really uncommon for a stranger to be targeted. Like you're way more likely to be killed by someone you know. So the guy you're worried about across the street is less likely to kill you than your brother or whatever. And that's just, just a statistical reality, right? So just the, the sort, of, uh, sort of stranger homicides in general are rare and then throwing on various sexual and um, you know pathological motivations um, extremely rare but very dangerous for that reason because once one of those great white sharks is on the loose they can hurt a lot of people and a lot of different families and leave a, a big mark on society And then going, that's the same with him with watching their eyes bulge out as he strangles them. And th that's the kind of thing I'm getting at with the abyss. These little realizations about the nature of man that I think occur to you, like the senselessness of it all somehow. Uh, that Again, this is the kind of stuff that as uh, disturbing as it can be, it's just absolutely fascinating. And I think the biggest thing is people, and I know I, I go through this, is trying to actually understand that because we're, we, all, we look at everything in life through our own set of rosy glasses. Mm. And so for me to, to say, yeah, I, I fully understand how you know, some sexual pervert can get off on something like that, it just doesn't resonate. And mm. so I, I think that's one of the things that, like you said, if a, if a normal police officer also has that same lens and he's, he's viewing things or she's viewing things through their own set of morals and childhood experiences, whatever, whatever makes that person that person. Yeah. And it, it just doesn't resonate with somebody that is just so off counter where you're looking at them saying, how, how does that even start to like sexually arouse yeah. you or, you know, the, the dominance type of thing. It's like, yes. where does that so, come from? So the abyss, now that, you know, I've been thinking through it a bit more as I'm talking to you, I would define it as a place where meaning collapses, right? So we walk around as beings who have sort of structured and conceptualized the world around us. And we have these divides, like doing this is good, you know, doing this is bad. And, you know, these are the reasons for it. And we have this organized little set of how people should operate. And then if you're in a certain profession or you get unlucky, you find yourself in a certain circumstance, and maybe this will happen to you more than once, you will look right into the abyss and all that meaning that you've been using to operate on your whole life will just, you know, collapse. And that's the existential crisis. And I'd think how I would maybe articulate what I was saying to you before a bit better is we've got to separate cause from reason. Like what caused this to happen? And was there a reason this happened? Right? So we could take somebody like Mr. X who gets off on watching women's eyes bulge out and, as he strangles them and that sexually activates him. And we could say, okay, well, he's a psychopath and we know the cause of being a psychopath is having white matter in your prefrontal cortex and you're going through your limbic system into your amygdala. And then perhaps he was looking at those detective magazines where the women looked all afraid on them. And he did, you know, maybe he had, been masturbating to those at a young age or something and it sexually condi conditioned him to get off on you know, women being afraid and then he disinhibited, he disinhibited himself because he smoked that 
crystal meth or you know what I mean? Like we can keep adding on causes and it doesn't mean that they're not true. We can even prove that they're true in some instances, but all those causes don't add up to a reason, you know, some sort of greater cosmic reason. Right. We're just explaining why the ape did the weird thing, but um, as far as causally, but we're not explaining the meaning behind it. And sometimes I think you realize there is no meaning. It's, you know, and, and that's where you look into the abyss. Wow. Fascinating. I, yeah. again, it's just one of those things that I, I think the vast majority of the population, because they, they really have no personal experience with it. And, and it's because of that, it's so difficult to actually comprehend that somebody's mind could act, you know, be activated or, or function mm -hmm. in that, that capacity and, and at that level that would cause them to do something that, that seems to the vast majority of people just so horrific that they would never even contemplate doing that. I don't know, maybe that's one of the reasons that those kind of horror shows are so popular is because it's kind of like the ability really to kind of separate the two and say, well, you know, this is real life and this is kind of uh, Hollywood fantasy. And, but, you know, all of those ideas come from somewhere. Would you not acknowledge that uh, the better horror movies or the better thriller movies don't focus on the sewer? So let's take a look at like Jason part seven or something like that, right? It's pure sewer. It's like the machete made the blood go blah, you know, and it, 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 oh, that's all it is. There's no abyss to it at all, mm -hmm. but the best ones don't even need any sewer or, or not much of it. Right. It's all something else that's getting at you and you can't quite figure out what, uh, you know, what about it? It is when you're watching the shining, which I would say is a masterpiece of horror it's not the fact that there's blood coming out of the elevator. You're not going gross blood. It's that it's asking some sort of question of you, right? A, abyss. <laughs> right. Yeah. And you also think about, I, I think the Hannibal Lecter series is one of those as well. You're like, whether they're, they're realistic or not, it's still, it's, it's one of those places where they masterfully take you to this dark place and I, I think all of us kind of look at that and say, is that really something that I could experience? Or is that mm -hmm. really something that's even resonating with my brain, even if I'm just visiting there? Yeah. The interesting thing I find about those movies is Hannibal Lecter is who everyone focuses on. But I actually find in The Silence of the Lambs, James Gum, a.k.a. Buffalo Bill, much more horrifying and far more realistic because if you're paying attention in the movie, you realize that this is just a, another try at being a person, you know, the woman's suit that he's building. It's another identity because at the root of it, the man is just a black hole. He doesn't know who he is. He doesn't know how to be, and he doesn't know how to adjust to the world. So now he's going to try this and people are going to die all for him trying to resolve this problem that he has that's never going to go away. And they put even little elements of uh, what the French would call mise-en-scene in there. So if you're looking ar ar around Buffalo Bill's place, you'll see a little throw over the couch that has swaths on it, right? So a guy who has gone and been refused an operation to be a transsexual, I think it's unlikely to I think it's highly unlikely that he's a Nazi at the same time, just given their ethos, right? But what that almost hints at is that before he tried to become the transsexual, that this was another one, right? I'm a, I'm a white supremacist or something like that. He's just these trial identities that are just all failing because there's something fundamentally wrong with the man that won't let him fit into the world. And there are people like that, you know? Hmm. And I think what happens is some of us are really far away from that, really well adjusted. And that's probably the people it disturbs the most. And then I think there's people that get closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to that. And when you're in a certain proximity of it, it's horrifying still, but it's, it's something that you can make a living out of perhaps. Right. So <laughs> um, when I was, Doing my PhD, I was working with the 
great Eric Hickey, who was an expert on serial killers. And he said to me, you know, Lee, the pedophilia stuff, the sexual sadism, you know, that's all been done. There's plenty of studies on that. He said, but no one's really done any good work on necrophilia and cannibalism and the relation between the two. He says, but you, you have a special something. You're on the dark side. And he said, how would you like to do that? I think there's a career in that for you. And I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, that was my reaction to it. I wasn't thinking, um, oh, what will people think about me socially? Or, you know, can I take this? Uh, I don't know. Like, I, sure. What do you need me to do? Throw up a typology pretty quickly, start reading all the literature, get it all together. And the next thing you know, yes, and you did introduce me as an expert. You're not supposed to say I'm an expert, but there are so few of us in that particular field that I think it would just be blatantly dishonest if I said I wasn't an expert in the necrophilia stuff because there's only like one or two other guys, right? Yeah. So there's, um, you've got to be, I guess what, I, what I'm saying, you got to have the disposition for it and it's not something that you can grow. I, I think you can get a certain, you know, as we see with, with cops, you can get a certain callousness, you know, in a good way. You have to be calloused, but to really get down to the place where the sewer meets the abyss and spend your life down there, like right after I'm done speaking with you, I'm going to go right back to doing something else with it, right? I don't know. I think that it's something you have to be born with, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I look at you and I, 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 I kind of compare it to, I heard of a, um, a CSI who had just finished her four-year degree in forensic sciences and went out onto her first crime scene, which was a homicide. And the whole time that they were processing the crime scene, she was puking and couldn't handle it. That was and, the sewer. That was all the sewer too. Right. And, and that's not even getting into the abyss, like what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's people that can handle it. There's people that think they can handle it and really can't. And then there's people that are just it, it just doesn't bother them. And, and I think it takes a special type of person that can actually handle it and be able to process it and then compartmentalize it and then move on with the rest of their life. And that's whether or not that's um, widespread as, as you might think, I don't know. But like you said, there's only a couple of people in the entire world that do what you do. So with anybody that, yeah. 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 Well, anybody that wouldn't consider you an expert is just insane because they, that's your numerically i have to be in that one niche area <laughs> yeah just i would have to be uh but i also i've of course branched out that's the interesting thing is you can start by learning all the abnormal homicide stuff so uh, paraphilic stuff just for your listeners when i say paraphilia i'm talking about abnormal uh, sexual fantasies and and practices, para like paranormal philia like love, so an abnormal love. But I mean that's just part of it. I also look at people who you know write letters to the police or make weird phone calls bragging, and it's not necessarily a sexual thing at all. It's uh, in the most base uh, base level. Someone would say, oh, it's just attention seeking. You're like, well, why are they seeking attention? Well, they're not getting enough. Okay, but why do human beings need attention? right? Mm -hmm. And that's a whole other field that I studied there too. And of course, there's uh, cults and there's people who are psychotic who've completely lost their mind or people that are so fanatically religious to the point where it makes them homicidal and that line almost gets blurry, right? There's so many aspects of the deviant, um, like the abnormal stuff to understand that um, at some point you realize I have to understand the most mundane homicides, the day-to-day -day stuff too, in order to grasp all the, the weird stuff or else it's like, uh, what do they say to the man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail? Well, I don't want to be the guy who sees everything as a nail. I want a full toolkit. So then starting there, then I, I kind of began at the extremes and worked my way into husband and wife have an argument over money and temperatures flare up and one of them kills the other. And it's what Cloyd would call a grounder. You know, the police don't even have to investigate it. They call it in themselves. I don't know what I've just done, but mm. I guess I'm going to prison. That sort of thing. Yeah. Well, when you when you 
talk about all those and you're talking this big range and, and especially know, knowing just a portion of what you actually do and some of the stuff that you study and uh, that you have seen and help solve those kind of crimes. What percent do you think would be, I don't know, coined as normal compared to like what you are an expert in? Oh, I think more than 90%, maybe like 95 would be normal. I mean, that's why you have guys come from these uh, big city cops tend not to come to be trained by me because although they should, they will still learn stuff, but they've seen a lot of diverse types of crime, but it's like when you get people from smaller communities or, you know, safe counties and they may only see a certain, geez, I mean, they may only see a certain type of murder, may only see one or two murders in their whole time working with whatever agency or, or force that they're with. So I would say just based on the fact that when I encounter those people and I show them certain things that they've never seen the vast majority of it before. It's, it's gotta be, it's gotta be probably over 95%. But the thing is that the normal stuff doesn't tend to be compulsive or pathological. Like you don't have a guy who compulsively feels a need to flip out on his wife over, I don't know, dinner being ruined or something like that or or if you do he's he's a domestic abuser right you know he's a dv type guy and that has some similarities but really um when we get into the weird stuff there tends to be a more compulsive element to it so the person can't stop and so and the you know targeting of strangers too right that's the stranger most people people don't realize that it's really uncommon for a stranger to be targeted like you're way more likely to be killed by someone you know so the guy you're worried about across the street is less likely to kill you than your brother or whatever and that's just just a statistical reality right so just the this sort of uh, sort of stranger homicides in general are rare and then throwing on various sexual and um you know, pathological motivations, um, extremely rare, but very dangerous for that reason. Because once one of those great white sharks is on the loose, they can hurt a lot of people and a lot of different families and leave a, a big mark on society. So yeah, someone's got to do that. They don't need the easy stuff. You know, that's why they call them grounders, solving those other types of murder. Um, I'll give you an example. There is a cop I met that was working in child pornography, which thankfully I've never had to do that. Like to those guys, I actually think have it worse than me. If you want to talk about, you know, looking into the abyss every day, you know, having to look at those images, I've never had to do that. But I met this cop and, you know, this is what he did every day, but he came to one of my lectures and I think I'd done sexual sadism and necrophilia in about an hour or an hour and a half that day. And we were out having drinks later and he said, I want to thank you for teaching me that because I've seen some things and I didn't know what they were until you just told me. And, you know, when you hear that, you, you feel good because like, okay, but at the same time, it feels bad to know that, <laughs> you know, he just saw what I just described is, is pretty harrowing. So for me, there's almost some safety in, in being removed from it. You know, I can... I can teach it. I can study it from afar. I can interview these people, but if I need to move on, I can. It's not like this is your case. You know, you have to, I don't have to talk to families, right? That would be the hardest thing for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having to go to a family who's had something horrific, like a, a stranger murder, sexual homicide type deal happen and try and be of one mind with them and put and ensure them, give them full confidence that I'm going to solve it. And then actually also be the other person who has able to solve it. Right. Like it's uh, that part I'm thankful for. Well, and that's of, of all the, the detectives and even street cops or, or crime scene investigators, it, it doesn't really matter. If they're part of the investigative process, they're going to be also working with victims and victims' families. And I agree yeah. with you. That's, I, I think that's got to be one of the more emotionally taxing portions of it because I'm sure a victim's family, just like we're sitting here talking about 
all these horrific crimes and and the mental yeah. processes that people purely theoretically yeah right right but it's like trying to explain the the abyss uh because that that has to be one of the most harrowing questions that's out there for why? every victim and victim's family is how could why, this happen to me right and what why, 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 why did this happen yeah. Yeah. yeah and for a detective to to sit there especially one that maybe doesn't have hasn't gone through your training or uh, even even real extensive training when they actually talk about the abyss. So he or she may not know. And then how do you sit there in front of a grieving parent or or somebody saying, you know, explain to me, you're supposed to be the expert. You're you're the detective. You're the guy that's gone through this for forever. And and maybe this is a Cloyd question because of all the times that he's had to do it. But how how do those how do those detectives not only process the case that they're that they're working on, and all of them are emotionally invested in it. And then to also have to deal with the families and, and try to explain to them, not just physically and, and mentally yeah. what they're what they're doing in order to solve the case, but also how do you provide any level of comfort to these victims and victims' families? Well, how do you bring the structure or the meaning back to it, like what we were talking about before, right? Like these people were living their lives and then suddenly one day someone just grabbed their heads and said, hey, here's the abyss, look at it, right? 